Um, there's such a lot we could say about Hezekiah. He's a, a series on his own, but I've tried to trim and trim and trim and hopefully get within that golden 20 minutes, so we'll see what happens. I want to start with a really uh, depressing quote. It's from Richard Dawkins, who is a, a career atheist. He started life as a scientist who didn't like Christianity and is now approaching the end of his life as an anti-Christian who does a bit of science in his spare time. And he said this, an atheist is just somebody who feels about Jehovah the way any decent Christian feels about Thor or Baal or the golden calf. We are all atheists about most of the gods that humanity has ever believed in. Some of us just go one god further. Now when you hear things like that, I wonder if you feel a bit threatened. And when you, you know it's someone like Dawkins who's quite well respected in the scientific community, though not quite as well respected as he would like to think. Um, do you feel there's a bit of a weight in that? Does it feel a bit crushing sometimes? Or if you've got friends who are atheists and who've read around a bit and, and say similarly dismissive things, can that be tricky to deal with? Do we feel intimidated by it? Well, what I want to do today is look at a 2,700-year-old story uh, and see how it helps us to look at these kinds of ideas with the right perspective. Uh, and it's funny, really, isn't it, to think something that old can be so relevant to us now, but it absolutely is. You know, it's, it's fundamentals. So I want to give you a little bit of historical background to understand what's going on. So I'm sorry to have to, to do this, but it's, you'll thank me for it later. We talk about the kingdom of Israel sometimes as though it's this great long-lived thing. But actually, in the Old Testament, the, the, the unified kingdom of Israel was very short-lived. It really only had three or four kings. Uh, David is the best known one, and then Solomon. But after Solomon, there was a civil war to see who would be his successor as king. And the result was the United Kingdom of Israel broke up into two separate kingdoms, uh, and they were never reunited again after that. The northern kingdom kept the name Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. Um, and Solomon's son became the king of the southern kingdom, and that line of succession continued in the southern kingdom. And of course, a thousand years later, uh, Jesus would be born to that line. Now, the southern kingdom, we're told about both of these in, in two books in the Bible, Kings and Chronicles, and they give slightly different perspectives on the same events. But what both of them tell us um, is that there was a mixture of good and bad kings in the southern kingdom. Uh, and in the northern kingdom, they were all bad kings. Now, that may sound like really simple black and white morality to you. And you might think, where's the nuance here? Where's the shades of, of who was good and who was bad? But they're judged in the Bible really on, did they follow God or did they go chasing after idols? Uh, and that seems to be the foundation for everything here. And when you look at what followed from it, you can understand why. Because lots of the kings who are described as bad did things like um, physically sacrificing their children. So it isn't just a matter of were they on our side or their side. It's very fundamental uh, moral distinctions. Now Ahaz was one of the bad kings of Judah. Uh, he set up high places on all the mountains to worship all sorts of different gods. He was one of the ones who sacrificed his own children, burnt them to death. Um, and after 16 years of his reign, he died, leaving the southern kingdom in a terrible state. But his son Hezekiah, who was 25 years old, succeeded him, and somehow something about him was very, very different. And we heard in the reading from Paige, thank you, that in the very first month of the very first reign, uh, of the very first year of his reign, he reopened the temple of the Lord and restarted the worship. Um, and he did so much more than that. So. What we find, if you read through in the section in Chronicles, is we find that he himself provided an enormous amount of leadership. So he wasn't just delegating to the priests. But he was giving instructions. He was praying. He was contributing his own wealth to the rebuilding and the sacrifices. Uh, and the part of this that moved me the most uh, was reading, and I don't know whether you picked this up from the reading, because it's just lots of names that whiz past sometimes, don't they? It can be followed difficult to follow all the details. But the exciting thing to me is when he restarted the Passover, the 
the greatest feast that they had. He didn't just invite people from all over his own kingdom, but everybody from the northern kingdom as well. So a completely different country, people who had often been at war with the southern kingdom, uh, and yet Hezekiah reached out to them. And if I can just read you a couple of verses from 2 Chronicles 30. He sent out runners, and they went from town to town, throughout Ephraim and Manasseh, and as far as the territory of Zebulun. These are all areas of the northern kingdom. Most of the people just laughed at the runners and made fun of them. However, some people humbled themselves and went to Jerusalem. So you can see that as well as everything else that's going on with Hezekiah, one of the things that was obviously burning in his heart was a desire to bring in his brothers from the northern kingdom, to restore them as well as his own kingdom, to open a way for them to come in. And that's why it's so significant in the other part of the reading that Paige gave us, that he bent the rules, in fact more than the rules, the laws that God had given to Moses about how you had to prepare yourself to be ritually pure, to take part in these great feasts. Hezekiah looked at all the people from the northern kingdom as well as his own who weren't prepared and his decision was to bend those rules, to be gracious towards people who he had no reason to be gracious towards. It's a great example, really, of, of how Jesus looks at us when we come to him not in any way pure, not in any way worthy to participate in the celebration that he has for us, and just pushes those rules aside and says, I'm going to start by showing grace. Now, the way that we live can come later. The rules can come later. But it begins with Jesus showing us grace. And that's what Hezekiah did uh, 1,700 years. Uh, sorry, 700 years before the time of Christ. So what we've got here is a king who is dedicated to God, both personally and in terms of the kingdom that he rules, and being gracious to his own people and the people of another kingdom, an enemy kingdom, really, a king that everybody should have a chance to know God. So at this stage, it looks like everything is set up really nicely. And you might expect, you know, if you were writing this as a drama, instead of it being history, you would then probably have a chapter where there is a, a, a joyous reunification of the northern and southern kingdoms, like when the Berlin Wall came down and East and West Germany reunified but that's not what happens. Um, because three years into Hezekiah's reign, so his, in a way he's just got started really, and three years into that reign, Shalmaneser, who is the king of Assyria, hostile foreign nation, besieges Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom. And the siege lasts two years. At the end of it, Samaria is taken the country is not just invaded, it's disassembled. So the Assyrian king takes all the people of the northern kingdom and deports them to lots of other countries around, brings in lots of other people from all the other countries. And that country, the northern kingdom that Hezekiah had been reaching out to, is gone. And it doesn't come back. That's the end of the northern kingdom. And that's, that's true to this day. And do you remember when um, Jesus is telling the story of the Good Samaritan? Uh, now we think of the word Samaritan as like a good thing, and we think about the Samaritans who man the phone lines, don't we, and, and talk to people who are feeling suicidal. But at the time that story was told, the reason the Good Samaritan was such a shock is because the people Jesus was speaking to considered the Samaritans to be the bad guys. Now they were, as the Jews looked at them, down in Jerusalem, they would look up to the country where the northern kingdom used to be and see a kind of mongrel race of some leftover people from the tribes of Israel and some people who had been brought in from elsewhere and who were worshipping all sorts of strange gods. Those guys, the Samaritans, they were the outcome of, of what the Assyrians did in this story, this 700 years before. So how would Hezekiah have felt, I wonder, as this happened? Now imagine us in our situation. We, in England, we're sort of a southern kingdom, aren't we? Imagine Scotland as the northern kingdom. 
It's not always a, an easy relationship between the two countries, but fundamentally, there's a sort of a brotherhood between them. Now imagine a hostile power invades Scotland. Not only invades it, but destroys it and, and ships Scottish people all over the world, ships other people in, completely replaces it. How would we feel about that? So close to home. Probably some people that we know, people that we love. Hezekiah probably would have known some of the people from the Northern Kingdom who'd come to his festival. Terrifying times. And then, eight years after that, Assyria returns. New king of Assyria now, this guy's called Sennacherib, and this time he's besieging Jerusalem itself, the seat of Hezekiah's power, the capital of the southern kingdom, which is all that remains of the nation of Israel. And I'll read it. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, King Sennacherib of Assyria came to attack the fortified towns of Judah and conquered them. The king of Assyria sent his commander and chief, his field commander and his chief of staff from Lashish with a huge army to confront King Hezekiah in Jerusalem. Now, this is only eight years after the northern kingdom has been destroyed by this same country. So now just imagine this. Imagine uh, China or someone has, has destroyed Scotland and scattered its people over the world eight years ago in 2013. And now they're here and they're besieging London and they're going to do the same to us. How terrifying is that? How gut-level wrenching would that be to know that your brother kingdom, your sister kingdom, if you like, have been totally annihilated by these people? And now they've come with a huge army, it says. Hundreds of thousands of people. And then um, the chief of staff who represents this invading army uh, comes and speaks to Hezekiah's officials. And I'm going to read in some detail what he says because I really want to pick this apart and you'll see how it's relevant to us. It says, The Assyrian king's chief of staff gave this message. This is what the great king of Assyria says. What are you trusting in that makes you so confident? Do you think that mere words can substitute for military skill and strength? Who are you counting on that you've rebelled against me? On Egypt? If you lean on Egypt, it will be like a reed that splinters beneath your weight and pierces your hand. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, is totally unreliable. But perhaps you will say to me, we're trusting in the Lord our God. But isn't he the one who was insulted by Hezekiah? Didn't Hezekiah tear down his shrines and altars and make everyone in Judah and Jerusalem worship only here in Jerusalem? He goes on to say, I'll tell you what, strike a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can find that many men to ride on them. With your tiny army, how can you think of challenging even the weakest contingent of my master's troops? even with the help of Egypt's chariots and charioteers. What's more, do you think we've invaded your land without the Lord's direction? The Lord himself told us, attack this land and destroy it. And he said all this, not just to Hezekiah and his officials, but to all the people on the walls of Jerusalem listening to this besieging army. Imagine the discouragement. Imagine how crushed everybody felt. Now, there are several distinct strategies in this speech, and I want to show you them. First of all, the chief of staff argues that the people of Judah have displeased God. So you remember when he's saying, oh, Hezekiah, your king, who's supposed to be serving God, has taken down all the shrines in the high places, which is true, he has. But those shrines were used for worshipping pagan gods. Now, the accusation here is that what Hezekiah has done is, uh, is going to have disappointed God or made him feel that Hezekiah isn't the man that he wants there. So we'll think in a minute about how to counter that. And then the second thing that they bring is just discouragement. Do you remember dismissing Judah's military strength and basically saying, you don't have the strength to fight this battle, let alone win it. You can't even make a contest of it. And the third thing is this sneaky claim when he says, oh, the Lord himself told us to destroy Jerusalem. 
So he's saying that God has turned against Hezekiah and his people. Now, we know that's not true. It's going to become apparent in the next thing he says. But it's still such an insidious thing to have told them, you know, to undermine their sense of who they were. So one of the things to notice here is although they've come here with hundreds of thousands of troops, the Assyrians don't actually want to fight. I think they're a bit scared of fighting. What they want is for Jerusalem just to give up. They just want them to fold and say, all right, no battle. We're, we're just going to give up. And here's where this is relevant for us. Isn't that what our enemy wants when we're tempted? When we face temptation, when we face discouragement, there's a fight there to be had for us. But our enemy wants us just to give up. Um, and actually, often the things that we find ourselves thinking and feeling in those situations are exactly those same three things that the people of Jerusalem felt there. Because our enemy will bring the same discouragements that uh, the king of Assyria brought. So like them, we sometimes are told, do you ever feel this? You've displeased God. What you've done is disappointing him. He's not pleased with you. He's going to turn away from you. He's not going to be on your side. Just as the Assyrians told them. And the second thing is, you're not strong enough to fight this battle. This temptation is too much for you. This situation isn't something you can overcome. Why even fight? Why even try? Just shrug. Just give in. It'll be easier. And the third one, maybe the worst one, the idea that God wants this bad thing to happen to you. Something bad is going on in your life. And you sometimes find yourself feeling, yeah, this is God punishing me. This is what he wants. And then the Assyrians, again speaking here, bring out the fourth weapon. And I, again, I'm going to read you their words. A chief of staff from the Assyrian army says this. Don't listen to Hezekiah when he tries to mislead you by saying the Lord will rescue us. Have the gods of any other nations ever saved their people from the Assyrian army? What happened to the gods of Hamath and Arpad? What about the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena and Ivar? Did any god rescue Samaria from my power? What god of any nation has ever been able to save its people from my power? What makes you think that the Lord can rescue Jerusalem from me? And you know, this is basically what Richard Dawkins is saying right back at the beginning. You remember when I read that quote? He's saying, these gods, they're all the same. This god that you worship, there's nothing special about him. Well, so I think sometimes we hear this from our friends as well. Now, here's where this gets really interesting. The book of Chronicles is written in a very dispassionate way. It's just a list of this happened and then this happened and these people did this. But at this point, the writer of Chronicles, he makes an editorial intrusion. Like when you're reading, you know, in some kids' books, it'll say, and then they met a dragon, and the, the author sort of speaks directly to you and says, and if you've ever met a dragon, you know how that feels. You know that kind of, when the author speaks directly to you? This is what happens now in Chronicles. He says this, These officers talked about the God of Jerusalem as though he were one of the pagan gods made by human hands. Now this is the key insight here. Sennacherib and his army did not get this. He really thought that because wooden gods and metal gods of other countries hadn't been able to save them from him, uh, that it would follow that actual God couldn't stop him. And that's why he says, what God of any nation has ever been able to save its people from my power? So what makes you think the Lord can rescue Jerusalem from me? Now, notice this. He's not just saying the God that I worship is greater than the God that you worship. He's saying, I personally am greater than your God. Wow, that's some impressive arrogance. Well, and, and what this is like, to me, this is what it reminds me of. Uh, I assume everyone's seen Star Wars. So you, I'm just aiming for the most ubiquitous pop culture reference I can. At the beginning of the film, you remember, Star Destroyer zooms overhead. It just keeps going for minutes and minutes, huge ship. And it's chasing the tiny ship that the rebels are on board. Uh, it's the Tantive IV Rebel Blockade Runner. And it sucks it in with its tractor beam. And then 
Uh, the Imperials invade that ship, and the, as the door opens, you see Darth Vader behind there, the embodiment of ultimate evil, and he steps forward. <laughs> and <laughs> I can't help it, that's what he's like. And what this is like, so he takes that ship and he captures Princess Leia. Now imagine if Darth Vader at that point says, you know what, Princess Leia couldn't resist me, now I'm going to conquer George Lucas. That's what this is like. Now George Lucas, if you don't know, he was the writer and director of Star Wars. And it's as though a character in his film thinks he can step out of the film and take on the author. Or if you prefer the classics, Imagine Macbeth assassinating King Duncan and saying, right, now I'm going to go after Shakespeare. I'm going to have him next. Right. And this is the situation. You know, we are all, in some sense, sort of characters in a story that God is writing. Or if you like... Um, his position as the creator who is, in some senses, outside of the universe of time and space and made the universe of time and space and yet steps down into it and involves himself in it. The arrogance of thinking that we, little things inside that universe, can step right outside the universe and take on God. It's just, it's a mistake on so many levels. It's such a complete failure to grasp the nature of what's going on. Now, here's what's great in this passage. Sennacherib doesn't get this. The king of the Assyrians doesn't understand it at all. Hezekiah does. He's our hero here, right? Hezekiah, who was gracious to the northern kingdom, who drew people in to celebrating the nature of God, he sees it. So I'm going to read you again uh, this passage of Hezekiah's response. His prayer begins like this. O Lord God of Israel... You are enthroned between the mighty cherubim. You alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone created the heavens and the earth. Bend down, O Lord, and listen. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to Sennacherib's words of defiance against the living God. It's true, Lord, that the kings of Assyria have destroyed all those nations, and they have thrown the gods of those nations into the fire and burned them. But of course the Assyrians could destroy them. They were not gods at all, only idols of wood and stone shaped by human hands. Now, O Lord our God, rescue us from his power, and then all the kingdoms of the world will know that you alone, O Lord, are God. Now what Hezekiah sees here is it's not like a competition between the God of his nation and the God of another nation. They're completely different things. That's like a competition between Darth Vader and George Lucas or a competition between Macbeth and Shakespeare. God is not one of a range of options. As Hezekiah says, you alone created the heavens and the earth. Now I love the clarity of Hezekiah's vision. So how did this story come out, you ask me, if you're not familiar with the story of Hezekiah? What actually happened to this besieging army? Um, I'll read it to you. That night, the angel of the Lord went out to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. When the surviving Assyrians woke up the next morning, they found corpses everywhere. Then King, King Sennacherib of Assyria broke camp and returned to his own land. He went home to his capital and stayed there. You know, he, he's like, uh, I think of it like a wave just breaking on a rock just a wave coming in, and there's nothing it can do. It just smashes against it. It's useless. Sennacherib had completely misunderstood who and what God is. Now, when we face the same discouragements that Hezekiah faced, our response should be the same as his, which is to remember who God is. And that's not just the greatness of God, it's also the goodness of God. And of course, we've got an advantage that Hezekiah didn't have because we've got the accounts of Jesus. So God in human form, we can see his character much more clearly and more easily than Hezekiah could. So I want to finish by running through the four ways that the Assyrian army tried to discourage Hezekiah and his people and showing how we can respond when we're discouraged in the same ways. So here's the first one. Do you remember the, the, when he says, you've displeased God 
He's not going to be on your side. You've let him down. You've not done what he wanted. He's going to turn his back on you now. Well, if you ever feel that, no. God always wants us to return to him. And if you doubt it, think of Jesus restoring Peter after Peter had denied him three times. That is not the shape of a God who gives up on people or turns against them. That is a God who wants us to return when we fail. And if we then fail again, who wants us to return again? And so on. Here's the second threat. Do you remember the Assyrians say, you're not strong enough to fight this battle. You can't go up against me. Just give up. And the answer to that is, no, you're right. We're not strong enough. But we are not the ones who are fighting. God is at work in us. The Holy Spirit is in us. And if you ever doubt this, remember this. This is from Ephesians chapter 1. The incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. That can be the memory verse next year. I'm going to read it again. Absorb this. Get the truth of this. Know this for your own life. The incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. You don't get much mightier power than that. That is at work in us because God is at work in us. Here's the third discouragement. Remember this? The idea that God wants this bad thing to happen to you is turned against you for some reason. No, he's not on our side. And if you ever doubt that, here's another thing to remember. This could be the memory verse for the year after. Right? <laughs> Since he did not spare even his own son that gave him up for all of us, won't he also give us everything else? Let me read that one again as well. Since God did not spare even his own son that gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? This is what God is like. He is on our side and he has demonstrated it in the most emphatic way possible. And then finally there's this one. Remember that the last threat and the last discouragement the Assyrians brought was this idea that your God is nothing special. You might be relying on God. Maybe even he is working in you. Maybe he is on your side, but he's nothing special. He, he can't affect this. That's the threat. And the answer is, yeah, he is something special. He is above and beyond and outside the universe of time and space, but is not distant. He's not removed himself from us. He has come down into this universe and deals individually with each one of us. That's what he's like. And again, if you doubt it, here's a memory verse for three years' time. This time from Colossians 1, verse 15. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. It's talking about Jesus. That's not only the God we worship, it's the God that we love. So we don't stand against our Assyrians alone. When these discouragements come, whether they come from the depths of our own mind, whether they come from colleagues or, or enemies or even directly from demonic voices, wherever they come from, we don't stand against these discouragements alone. God is with us and we stand in his strength. So we can pray as Hezekiah prayed. And I'm finishing with this, so please absorb this. Hezekiah's prayer. It's so good. It doesn't begin with the circumstances. It doesn't begin with the Assyrians. It begins like this. O Lord God of Israel, you are enthroned between the mighty cherubim. You alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone created the heavens and the earth. And then at the end he just says this, Bend down, O Lord, and listen. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. In other words, that great power, that incomparable power, please just focus it down here in my situation and help me with what I'm facing now. So I'm going to pray to finish. Oh, great God, we thank you that we don't face life alone. We don't face discouragement alone. We don't face opposition alone. But everything that we face, we face with you. And you not just alongside us, but in us, working in our hearts. We think about Paul's words that we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because you are at work in us. 
And help us please to remember these truths and cling on to them. And when discouragements come, and even when enemies come, help us to remember these great truths about you. That you are for us, not against us. That you are at work in us. And that there is no limit to what you can do. Thank you that you are worthy of our worship. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.